Ponderous interactions. Okay. So, let me summarize at the beginning what is Ponderous interaction. So this is a long range interaction between chemical species arising from a correlation between instantaneous charge fluctuations. So that's an essential feature that we need instantaneous uh, charge fluctuations. So it is present where it, even when there is no chemical energy. And uh, we don't need permanent uh, multiple moments to have water mass interactions. This is another characteristic feature to distinguish water mass interactions from other kinds of deep interactions. Like, for example, hydrogen bonds that are permanent uh, multiple moments in that case. So the water mass interaction is weak. How much weak? Well, roughly. I just can say some kind of rough data. It's 100 times weaker than a chemical bond. But it's present everywhere. It's literally a ubiquitous interaction because we find it everywhere in materials, like in protein folds, in organic molecules, in liquid water, in layered materials. Etc. Etc. Can cite hundreds of examples. Okay, so now right at the beginning of this talk, I have to stress that in the past 10 years, 15, 10 years, there have been many Wanderbus methods developed. The Wanderbus interactions that was a hot area in the past decade. So there are literally tons of approximations to get the one that was correlation. So this talk is not particularly focusing on the description of these particular approximations. I think that everybody can find these approximations in the literature. And frankly, I am not an expert of these approximations. Probably the developers know them much better than I do. This talk rather focuses on the background physics of the Van der Waals interactions, and of course, if time allows me, then I will sketch some major features of some particular approximations. Okay, so what is the Van der Waals interaction, at least in the monometer sense? If we have a large separation of the or two ground states spherically interacting spheres, then the Van der Waals energy can be expressed as a power series in the inverse of the distance between these spheres. Now why spheres? Just for simplicity, no? Underwas interaction can be present between any kind of volumes, but for simplicity throughout this talk I will focus on spheres. There is a particular reason for that because if I do any derivation then I can derive basically the dipole moment just for simplicity instead of the multiple moments. And then I can prove this on spherical systems. Okay, so let's see what is this power series. So this is the boundary glass energy. Eight, ten, ten, and then we can go up to higher powers too. Okay, so apparently this is the leading term. In the asymptotic limit of the uh, large separation. And, well, this is an exact formula. So, this is basically just a mathematical formula. This is not nothing yet, not a one that approximation. This is a multiple expansion, which everybody can check. It can be derived from so a multiple expansion of the two of the Okay, we have a vector and R and the R prime. This is the angle between them. This is Two points just uh, symbolize the two fragments separated by some distance. This is just a multiple expansion. So what is C6, C8, and C10? So these are the one that was coefficients. Generic expression C2K. You will see immediately why the product C2K. You want to generalize them. So C6. So one there was coefficients. So one there was 
coefficients characterize among the Gauss interactions. Okay? Qualitative. So C6, that is responsible for the dipole dipole interaction. C8, dipole or dipole, quadrupole. And the C10 characterizes even more. That's the so that's the quadrupole, quadrupole, and the dipole oxygen interactions. Okay. okay, so we have an exact expression. Now let's see what is the C2K. And in my lecture, sometimes I follow some kind of reverse engineering or some kind of reverse logic, and there's a very simple reason for that, because these are kind of long and tedious derivations, which I'm not, uh, I'm not allowed to do within this time, so I just try to focus on the physics. Okay, so there is an expression which basically summarizes the underlying coefficients for C to K in a general sense. K is B if we have A and B fragments separated by distance. Okay, so let me just check this numbers here. Okay, hopefully nothing more is missing. Okay, or I get tangled from L1, L2, and then you have your symbols. Okay, so this is the famous Casimir Paul the integral, which summarizes the one that was coefficient. Okay, let's see what I'll be wrong there. Okay, apparently what everybody can be called there is the frequency integral. So the product of the polarizabilities, multiple polarizabilities on each fragment and the integral of the imaginary frequency. Okay? So this is something that everybody can remember. So what is K? Well, K is a number, okay? Uh, which varies between 3 and 5. And okay, so if we have 5, then we have uh, 3 here in the sum, 3, 2, and 1. So that number just simply controls how many terms we have in the sum. So if we have K, one, then we just have the C6 term, so this is the leading term, we have just one term in the sum. If we have K2, then beside the C6, we will see the C8, okay, so two terms. If we have the K3, then we have all the terms, at least the C. C, C, A, and C, K. Okay, so then we have all kinds of uh, wonderful coefficients at least listed here in this multiple expanded dipole, 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 quadrupole, 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 and the types of interaction. What is L? Well, necessarily not right. L, L1, L2, L3, and P, so these are the uh, uh, L is the uh, vibrational mode. of the plasma. Okay, so this concept of the plasma has here, here, which will be a relevant feature or the concept, key concept in the under interaction, so I will produce that later. So right now what we just have to keep in mind that this is multiple order, okay? and call it that way too. And we have an L1 and L2, which are related like, like this. Okay. 
So this is it. And well, everybody can check these numbers. And what really we need right now is this frequency integral. Because this is what expresses the physics of the one and last dimension. Uh, I think this goes from k to 5. Uh, yes, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, three to five, yes, yes. Just the one. Well, yeah, it, 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 it is here. It's here, it just depends how you do it, you know, if you, k goes from three to five, but I will k minus two in the sum, you know? Just the one. <laughs> okay, now. So where is this integral coming from? Well, this is an expression which is basically in a course of second order correlation energy, second order from second order perturbation. So let me write about the second order perturbation. Write a lot of integrals. Everybody is tangled that we have an energy here, we have an energy here. This is also a wonder mass energy. At the end, we have an exact energy. Here's a second order perturbation energy, correlation energy, in terms of the screen Coulomb interaction. <coughs> Interaction basically everybody can recognize this is the Coulomb interaction. Now I call R1 2 the distance between the fragments E squared, that's what the rather E is the charge of the electron. And we have the density density response function. And yes, this is exactly the density density response function which appeared yesterday in EFA stroke, maybe even in Hardy stroke. If you look at the density density response function from slightly different aspect now in terms of the van der Waals interactions. So this is the density density response function. This is what we need to get the van der Waals interaction. <coughs> this is a non-local Okay, we see R1 and R1 prime and the same applies to the other element with the other coordinates. Okay, so now of our quantity, this is why we need so many integrals. We can go over all these R1, R1 prime, R2, R2 prime. Is it H cross over 2 by 3? H bar. Yes, that's an H Okay, now, we want to understand where is this expression coming from. And then, I need to uh, attach some explanation to this uh, second order of perturbation energy. If you have two fragments, and just as I said, I restrict myself to spheres. We have one sphere here, one sphere here. We have a distance between them. Okay. But we get them on their wise interaction. Van der Waals interactions can be actually obtained exactly from the so-called RPA, uh, RPA density function. Almost exactly, 
because the archaeology of the field might be so strong, so the government has this exchange for a little cardinal, but theoretically the RPA would give the exact mass interaction. RPA is a density function of this approach and has a normal cut and uh, density density response function and the normal cut could also have the Coulomb interaction. What is the Coulomb interaction? Okay. Right, what is the relevance of the Coulomb interaction in terms of the mountain class interactions? And what are these coordinates? R1 and R1 prime, R2 and R2 prime. Okay, so these are spatial variables. But where they are. Okay, so we can define R and R1, R and R prime to be located on one of the values. We can find another R, another R prime, okay, then another R. And what if, if R is here, some bounds of fragments, R, and R prime is another fragment. Which kind of spatial variable pairs are related to other parts of directions? Now, if we look at the Coulomb interaction, we can actually make a distribution of the Coulomb uh, operator, like this, like this, like this, and like this. Okay? This is just some arbitrary distribution of the Coulomb in question. One one is again in that situation when both spatial variables are much longer. Two two basically corresponds to the other situation when the both spatial variables are in the second pattern. This is what we want when we want one the remarks interactions. So these are even with a couple of terms within the Coulomb interaction. When one spatial variable is in system A, other spatial variable is in system B. Okay, so this is what we want. Now when we have an RPA approximation, and now I'm just sketching this Jacobs ladder, uh, what John was talking about. Yes? Sorry, I didn't understand. So the, the cool interaction is just R and R prime, right? So how that do is, we... yeah, that is, yeah, uh, that is, that is R and R prime, but you can arbitrarily distribute the cool of interaction. You need the distance. No, this, you need the R and minus R prime. That is just the distance, or the absolute of the distance. There are no spatial variables from the anywhere. Could you draw an example? Uh, this is an example. It's not That's so fine. much to, you know, that you have two spatial variables. <laughs> what you want, R minus a prime, they are right. So that would be the Coulomb interaction. So where you put R and where you put R prime can be anywhere. You know, both can be on one fragment and other one, or, or both can be on the other fragment. Or one R can be here in system A, and R prime can be in system B. Yeah? It's up to you how you define the distances. When I'm talking about RPA, this gives a correlation energy uh, with the bare common interaction. The RPA accounts for the free correlation energy. RPA is an approximation which describes one the first interactions. But within RPA, we see all kinds of possible distributions of the spatial variables. So what does it mean is in, in the language of physics? That RPA also accounts for that kind of correlation which is not necessarily linked to one of the interactions. Two correlation energy. When we are talking about the second order perturbation energy, this just gives a part of the correlation energy which is responsible for the one there was interactions. Okay, so this is it. So apparently, this is an approximation. It doesn't necessarily give you the full correlation energy. But this is what we want if we want one there was interactions. We want to capture one there was interactions. How to derive this? Now, John, you agree that that is not so easy. What you have to record to derive is, first of all, what is the second order per, uh, perturbation? What is the multifold exp expansion? And how you distribute the Coulomb operator? <coughs> I don't know 
if I have ever really seen a full derivation of this, it's kind of the best of them you can find in John Dobson's paper. If somebody is interested, I can give the reference. But this is where it is coming from, and this is the physics of the second order polarization energy, second order perturbation energy. Okay. Okay, so now we know some basic concepts. So we know what is the power expansion, we know what are the one term of coefficients. Okay, we know this generic formula for the one class coefficient. We want to know the origin of this polarizer. Now let's recall the email response theory. Just almost the same way as it appeared in Nipa's talk. Uh, so the so Nipa gave such a beautiful lecture. I and he, it's my business here. I don't really have to write the basic concepts anymore. Just to remind you of the linear response theory. So if you have a system and we apply a small perturbation, that's very important that we have a small perturbation, then the density of the system changes. Okay, we get a small change in the density of the system. And again, as many times already happened, we see the density, density response function, which is a non-local quantity, at least in the exact theory, which should be a non-local function, that measures the electronic response at R due to a frequency-dependent electric field perturbation at R prime. Okay, so again, we need R and R prime, and the frequency dependence. Now, we have a weak electric field. Let me write up the expression. But before doing this, one there was, when we are talking about one there was interactions. One there was interactions in credits from both from classical physics and quantum mechanics. Now, what I will be writing up. These are the classical physics components. Okay. So let's remind us uh, ourselves of a weak electric field. Okay, the relation of the weak electric field and the potential. Okay, we're working with our prime now. Huh? So that everybody knows this one. Classical physics, the potential in the z direction Okay, so that would be our potential in the z direction, so there's a uh, Linear function of Z prime. Okay, so this is our dot product here. Okay, so what is the electric field? What we get from these two expressions? or the linear response uh, theory from all these expressions. <coughs> all we have to do just to use this expression instead of the potential and plug it in into this expression of the linear response theory. So we have the density density response function and Yeah. 
let's proceed. So we have the linear response theory, but we don't yet have a polarized ability. So what is the polarized ability? Now, and here comes the approximation that in my derivations I restrict myself to spherical symmetric system. So I just look at this sphere. Then we will have a dipole moment, right? So everybody can recall what is the definition of the dipole moment. So that's a vector, right? Okay, so that is the definition of the dipole moment in the z-direction. is continuous to here. And what I do, I just put together everything, all the information what we have uh, received by now. Bracket here. So instead of the density chain, now I am using this expression, what we get with the density, density response function of the potential, then we get something, which is actually not simpler. This is it, okay? So it becomes quite simple. Here we have the dipole moment. And we are getting something which contains the basic concept of bounded bias interactions, the polarizability, in this case just the dipole polarizability. Okay. 
know. So this is the definition. And if we have a speed, we can define the support resonance frequencies. For the sphere, the dynamic polarizer reaches become resonant. Resonant at certain frequencies. So these are the resonance frequencies. Omega L. Okay, so what are these resonance frequencies? How are you doing in time here? Or I lost track all the time. Uh, oh. You too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the 45 minutes is up. Right. No, no, sorry, 30 minutes. 35 minutes. We've got 10 more minutes. Hmm. Okay. Not enough, but what can I do? Yeah, 10 more minutes. Regular time. Okay, so there is no difference. Yeah, do you understand the resonant frequencies? You have to introduce the concept of the plasma. Would you invite that frequency? Dynamic polarizabilities are resonant at these frequencies. Mm, okay. Um, let me come back to your questions because I need to proceed okay. a little bit in my explanation to introduce what resonance means. Okay? Don't let me forget to answer your question. Okay, so. at a certain frequency, of course it's called the plasma oscillation, but n is the direct intensity. So, okay, so this is the resonance frequency of the uniform electron density of an infinite system. Okay, so this is very important to understand. So plasma oscillations are so-called collective oscillations. Now we have to distinguish the plasma oscillations from the so-called particle hole excitations, the plasma excitations from the particle hole excitations. The plasma oscillation of these are relevant for other class interactions. Okay, so this is the uniform electron density of an infinite system, but what if we have a finite system? We have a metallic sphere. As an interacting fragment relevant for one der Waals interactions, like a molecule, well, a molecule is not to be metallic, but kind of spheres or something which is relevant for one der Waals interaction of
And this is multiplied by a function with L, that's the multiple order. Okay? So that will change the picture for the reasonable frequency. Okay, so what is L? Now let's say the simplest case, L1. What kind of interaction does it belong to the type of? Dipole oscillation. So dipole oscillation can be driven by the uniform electric field. Okay, so This is the Z direction, this is the dipole interaction, dipole oscillation. And what is the corresponding frequency? Okay, that's it. Okay, simple enough. Next case, then we have L2. So that is the quadrupole, quadrupole oscillation. Okay, so Okay, so this is the resonant frequency that belongs to the quantum oscillation. Now everybody can do it for him or herself for the next day, but it's just beyond my, uh, my capability to make a picture that belongs to the optical uh, excitations. So well, what is the conclusion? The frequency changes once compared to the resonance frequency defined for the, uh, for the uh, collective plasma oscillation. And the frequencies also change in this order as they go up for the higher multiples. Okay? So what are the frequencies becoming? If you follow the sequence, so the frequencies are becoming the frequency high. Okay? They compare what other frequencies compared to the first case were the dipole. The frequencies are becoming lower if we compare these frequencies to the plasma excitation. Now, that's nice. We have a nice sequence, but what happens when we get to the L infinite? So at least what is the physical meaning of that? Okay. Okay, so this is what belongs to the L infinity, and what is that? What does it mean? So we get the frequency of the surface plasma. Okay, so what? Okay, everybody can play with this number. So what is the physical background? Apparently, if you increase the order of the multiples, dipole, quantum, and the infinity, the charge distribution changes, right? So that's the physical meaning. So compared to the uh, first case, compared to the plasma, the charge distribution becomes more and more refined. So eventually, when we get the infinity, the, the charge density will appear on the surface. Okay, so that's the, that's the physical background of this resonance frequency. Okay, now, so still this was so far the classical physics component of one der Waals interaction. Now, what is the quantum mechanical source of the one der Waals interaction? What happened to my image? Okay. <laughs> Okay, 
so far what we have had, we have definitions for the basic identity response function, we have definitions for the model for polarized abilities, we have the reason of the person, it was what causes the time for If you have two fragments, okay, again, and just go in the spheres. The zero point energy which belongs to each particle oscillation. Okay, so there are these multiple oscillations, and you can assign these multiple oscillations, or you can assign the multiple moments to these multiple oscillations. The dipole can be particle, can be optical. So these multiple oscillations characterized by the zero point energy. So this is the source of these multiple. Okay? So compared to the classical physics, in the classical physics we have these oscillators, but in fact mechanics you also have oscillators, but these become quantized oscillators in quantum mechanics. So these zero point oscillations We have one fragment which produces the zero point oscillations. This will produce a long range electric field. So, notice that this is the electric field that I was talking about when I derived the second electron. So, this is what we have as an electric field that will interact with the zero point oscillations on the other sphere. And then the other sphere that that polarizes the first fragment. That's going back and forth, back and forth, so we have a one that interaction and couple uh, Coulomb interaction between the two fragments. So that, that's all required. Oh, okay, so, okay, let me just finish this and maybe that's just can be done in a few minutes. So that is the one der Waals interaction. Uh, with the zero point oscillation and things in the qualitative sense. So, it's a little bit to be more precise, as precise as I can be. In fact, this is just a hand waving argument that I can give you, but hopefully that expresses the nature of the one der Waals interactions. Now, we have again the picture with the two fragments. One and two, okay, in my notation. So the zero point motion on number two precise the dipole moment. Very for simplicity, I'm just looking at the dipole, uh, which gives rise to the dipole electric field. So what is that field? That field is like D2. R minus 3. So this R, that's the distance between them, and we're seeing the idea of how to get the number of loss interaction. Okay, now, number one species is a polar identity. In the simplest case, this is a dipole polar identity. We get coin out alcohol. This is responding to this electric field. Response to F1. 
So what is this response? The response will manifest in a dipole moment. And now number one. <coughs> dipole moment is number one. The is right of the one and one. Okay? So I have something to work with. I use the previous information for F1. The P is the other one. And P2 to the minus 3. Right? Now we are on species 1. But as I said, what you think is we see that polarized number 2. So we will have a backfield. <coughs> If I call now F2, this is P1, minus 3, which equals now uh, in one more up to the minus 3. Okay, it's shaping up. If you have a jet for God, then the molecule expansion is leaving the we have to need right now the minus C6 for the R6. Uh, then we can express the one that was energy as minus F2 times B2. Okay, the back course now, so this is minus R1, R2 minus 6. Okay, we have almost everything for the leading curve. Okay, we have the alpha bar that can be familiar or can be identified in the cosmic polar formula, at least one component, one alpha component. We have the R to the minus stage. That's very crucial. That's the leading power or the distance to the leading power. Now, what is this? That's really at this point the only component we cannot really account for. Since I feel like some kind of dipole moment. Here's the square of the dipole moment. And without going into any previous derivation, you can see what it will be. And here, at least, looking at the definition of the dipole moment, this expression is proportional to alpha 2, the polarizability. Now what is this h bar omega 0? The omega 0 apparently that's the frequency. That's the frequency which belongs to the oscillation. h bar, where is h bar coming from? That from quantum mechanics. No? So basically, this is like a kind of average value in expectation of that of the quantum oscillator. And now we have everything. So minus 6. Okay. Well, this is very clear. We have this in this expression. C6, if you remember the cosmic border integral, then you can identify these two terms here because you only had one alpha one, we have the alpha two. Well, the integral, okay, that's what is the hand rate in and you can see this quantity, this alpha 1 times alpha 2 is the conduct of an average value that makes up for the integral. So then we get the number of connection. It's possible. Okay, now I'm afraid I'm running out of the time, so the approximations. Okay, basically we can. We have to make approximations, okay, for the polarizability. Why is that? Because we don't really know the spatial dependence of the polarizability. So there are basically two kinds of approximations, but the class of care kinds of approximations, empirical and non-empirical. I'm not necessarily looking at pairwise approximations only. So when we are talking about one pairwise interaction, we can make a kind of hierarchy of these approximations. Now, I can make up a ladder on the analogy of John's ladder, but unlike John's ladder, you can find in the literature this is just a hierarchy I'm making up. So it comes out from my mind. Right now, I don't know how many runs we have, but certainly at the lowest run, we have runs behind the pairwise approximations. 
why are they there? So if they have two, two fragments, we can distribute the space into small components. What are the small, small fragments? Then this depends on your approximation. Can be atoms, but can be just simply very small volume elements. So this is I. This is what I call I. This is what I call J. When we make a pairwise approximation, summing up all pairs where I is on one fragment and J is on the other fragment. Here, the pairwise interaction of the boundary mass energy. Okay? This is kind of sketch. So, pairwise approximation can be empirical, can be non empirical. Here and with the more strong are empirical. And these are the non empirical ones. Examples are the BFT, is the core BFT, B2. I then out of my mind what is the name of that approximation. BFT, B2, okay. BFT, B2, or BFT, B3, basically made up by Grimmer, not really approximated. So each of these approximations is on the ground refinement. So in fact, this ladder is really just a sketch because there are so many refinements, so it's basically these rounds are right now merging at this lowest rounds. Pairwise approximations, there are non-local functionals. I'm a little bit in trouble where to locate the non-local boundary mass functionals. In the sense, they are also pairwise, but somewhat more sophisticated, so probably I should put them non-functionals like the Rutgers, Chalmers functional, or the DV10, it's a recent, relatively recent non-local functional, it's non-local. And what is, the, what is the next one? It's something which accounts for the so-called non-activity of the boundary mass interactions. What does the non-activity mean? Which is beyond the pair bar. Okay, when you make up this pair, there is something which remains beyond them, which is not accounted for this pair by summation of the boundary mass So this is the MBD in any body. On the bus approximations, first version of the input data, Alex Kachenko and collaborator, and there is the other basic approximation, which is in theory exact. I'm finishing, you know, I know very angry groups from here. <laughs> so if everybody is curious what are these approximations, what they can and what they cannot do, then we can discuss it later. Okay. Think about um, the depth function and the functional, and uh, which part of the function and the function could be used most in the in the rise of depth? Is it if you hard to if you exchange for oh, okay. relations? Because you said that uh, this long range direction arises uh, from correlation between continuous charge situations. Yes. So which part of the function is the functional responsible for this? Which okay. part do I need to approximate the best in order to catch this? Very good question. And unfortunately, because of the microphone and so much information, I have to tell you that from the bus, it's not really a static function at all. So probably that I could have told it in the beginning. This is a very non-local interaction. And most of the one there was interactions, one to <coughs> Express a von der Waals energy based on DFT. This is just the sum of an energy from some DFT approximation correlation. I should write now, I'm just talking about correlation. This part, this is the component which comes from DFT. So this is some kind of DFT based correlation function, but this accounts only for the short term. The von der Waals, what I was talking about, 
that is a long range correlation which should be always added to the DFT component. How it is added? Well, uh, in, in a generalized way, you know, it, uh, summarized, you use the, some wonderful correlation functionals, either terminal, no local functional, or, or whatever you have. And you use a so called dumping function. You need a dumping function because you don't, don't want to overlap with your DFT correlation. No? It's one possible dumping function. This is, for example, I think this is the dumping function by uh, Erin Johnson and Axel Beckett. There are hundreds of dumping functions, just along with the one there was approximation, there were many dumping functions created. This is just one possible example of them. Now, when you look at this formula, what can you see in this? What is R? Okay, R is the distance between the fragments, as I defined. Immediately you can see that there is a singularity when the R goes to zero. We want to avoid that. Okay, so that's it. that's why we need this dumping function. This is the mathematical singularity. There is another singularity. I don't know if I would necessarily have to say singularity, but this is a kind of physical singularity. And that corresponds to that picture when you have one sphere and other other sphere. You're getting them closer to that point when the sphere starts overlapping. Okay, so it is one sphere with one radius, another sphere with another radius. The sum of these two radii, this is this R van der Waals, which is so-called van der Waals radius. Okay, that's the point when you want to avoid, to avoid the, the, uh, so the, that's the short range component, which comes from DFT. You can account for the short range correlation uh, within DFT, and you have to cut off the long range van der Waals functionals when, uh, when you get to that point that the overlap, overlapping of the fragment uh, stop. Okay, that's basically what corresponds to that picture. And this is what this dumping function does. Okay, you get a number, basically, if you look at that distance, when the van der Waals radius becomes the same as the distance. That's, that's no problem because the Van der Waals function should be sharply cut off. Okay? So the Van der Waals is a little bit beyond the FD approach. So when we are talking about the Kohlschan equations, when we are talking about your energy correlation, energy that comes from from DFT, you are just talking about the short range correlation. So what I was talking about that's, that's beyond that, that's no local. When you say beyond the FD, it's beyond the central Well, of course. Um, yeah, because you know, it's, it's a little bit delicate, so probably I shouldn't be so much sharp in my definitions because there is this Jacobs ladder. These three rounds are the semi local functionals. Beyond that, that's the hybrid round, and this is the RPA. Okay, that's what I was mentioning in my talk. That is a, that gives you a long range correlation, which actually gives the one that was interaction, but not below. You know, neither semi-local functions actually so not even the highly functionals are, are designed for one der Waals interaction because what the fourth hand does that defines another kind or introduces another kind of non-locality, this is so-called exchange like non-locality, which is necessary for uh, creating the um, self-interaction related problems. But the one der Waals non-locality is a different kind of non-locality in terms of the spatial variables, R minus R prime. That, you know, only density function is basically RPA, which is a uh, density function of both X can account for the one der Waals interaction. Okay, let's thank that.